afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by Speedway Properties. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership. Please go to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. Uh, his great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. He has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J and L Lee Company, a publisher of regional books as well as the coinery. He has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. He is on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. He is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. This is a series of talks titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this program is number 29. These programs are videotaped and shown on uh, Link TV. Um, Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Number 29 of 13, I think, if I remember correctly. <laughs> we start today with uh, Muni Pool, and an interesting picture. We decided, I think, that it's Jim Haberland, the architect that's on the left that was a lifeguard in this particular picture. Uh, Muni Pool started about 1918 at 23rd and M Streets in and part of Antelope Park. The pool itself was 85 feet long and 50 feet, or 50 yards, excuse me, deep. It was 10 foot deep in the center, and it was a pool which, instead of having one end deep and the other end shallow, uh, it was deep in the middle and shallow on the edges, uh, 10 foot deep in the middle, ran east to west. The diving boards were on the east end and the west end, and it was a zero depth pool, which was certainly something which we're now doing more of on the north side. Uh, in the summer, in order to keep the water temperature cool, uh, they would float ice in it. And in the wintertime, uh, they would flood it with water and use it for ice skating, which is uh, not done with pools much anymore because it isn't very good on the pools. Uh, 1920s, they built, a, uh, they built a pump house on the east end, here shown boarded up. The bathhouse itself, which still stands, uh, was on the south uh, or on the west end of the building and the south end of the building itself was a concession stand which also served the softball diamonds uh, which were adjacent to it. By 1950 uh, it was quite a complex. It had uh, the pool itself, a cro croquet court, eight horseshoe courts, five softball fields, six tennis courts, and two volleyball fields. Uh, 1947, the Circlet Theater, which had been downtown in various locations, including the uh, Lincoln Hotel, combined with the Lincoln Community Theater, and they started putting their plays on in the bathhouse itself, uh, and then later built their own facility out on 56th and roughly Normal Boulevard. The pool itself was ultimately filled in. It's still there, as far as I know. Parts of it were lobbed off uh, in the straightening of Antelope Creek. Uh, they then immediately built a smaller pool called Kuklin Pool uh, towards the north end of this pool, but it didn't survive too long. So the only thing that's left today are the bathhouse uh, and what I think is at least part of the pool which has been filled in as a parking lot and paved over again. Now, can I remember? Yeah. <laughs> the Municipal Airport. And... I thought there was a way that I could see the next slide coming up up here, but I don't. I only see the slide projected, so I don't know where we're going for sure. Um, the first airfield in Lincoln was rather uh, a temporary structure and was actually part of the Lincoln Country Club. Uh, the Lincoln Country Club at that time was located just to the uh, east side of where Gooch's Mill is today on the old governor's grounds. And in 1920, a lady by the name of Mrs. H. H. Wheeler took off from the Lincoln Country Club uh, in a, literally a blinding snowstorm in order to take the electoral votes from uh, Nebraska to the convention. Uh, she really didn't make it in time. She had to sort of hop, skip, and jump because of the weather. 
But in 1921, uh, the major airfield for the city of Lincoln uh, was the one which ran from Van Doren Street to Calvert Street, uh, about overlying 19th Street, and the field parking lot was down about where the Van Doren swimming pool is today. We have some pictures of it. Uh, first airmail service came to Lincoln uh, in 1927. By that time, we had opened the Lincoln Memorial Cemetery uh, flying field. I'm, I'm saying that only as a location. It was towards the north end of the cemetery, just about over Matt's house, I think, um, and had a building on Old Farm Road, which was just torn down not too long ago. And that field survived for a while. Uh, in 1928, they looked at three large tracks to make a municipal airfield for the city of Lincoln. Finally purchased 160 acres of land north of the Capitol Beach Amusement Park. Uh, paid $3,600 for it. A uh, bond issue was then floated and it passed by 161 votes. So not overly popular. Uh, but by 1929, uh, even though we had uh, United Airlines coming here in 1929, we had the first airmail service in the city. 1930, that field was dedicated and was called Lindbergh Field. Built this little run brick building. This is, shows it added on to slightly. Uh, Lindbergh Field as a name didn't last too long because it turned out there was another Lindbergh Field in California. So it was renamed uh, as for a while uh, Lincoln Municipal Airport. Sort of back and forth between names. Uh, and when this picture was taken there was also still a building left of the Lincoln Airplane and Flying School, which was directly to the west of this. 1940, of course, with the beginning of the war, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes, uh, the municipal portion transferred out to Union Airport, which is uh, just directly north of Havelock, uh, ran parallel to 56th Street, and that airfield still it has some remnants left. It has two uh, brick and masonry hangars. It has the old beacon, which is there. A few things here and there reminiscent of that. Uh, they would have probably left the municipal airport out there, but they were constrained because it was uh, north-south runway was the primary runway. The north end literally comes up to Salt Creek, and the south end literally comes up to the city of Havelock. So they really couldn't enlarge it any. They did have some paved runways, but it didn't take on too well to enlargement. Uh, and of course, with World War II, uh, we expanded, bought another 3,000 acres of land. Okay, <laughs> I'll figure this out yet. Maybe, <laughs> about the time we're done. Um, 19, after the war, the airfield was returned to the city of Lincoln, reinstituted uh, uh, several times. But by 1968, it had 5,500 acres of land. And in 1975, we built a new terminal, a uh, $3.5 million terminal, which we're still using today. At one point, uh, before, uh, just before the new terminal was built, it was one of the longest runways in the world, and I believe that it was advertised as the seventh longest runway in the United States. Uh, and the last I knew, which is probably now well out of date, it was still an emergency standby uh, for the space shuttle landing. If weather and everything else conspired against it in all its other sites, it was still a site where they could have landed here, but it was down the road, I think, fifth or sixth, something like that, and obviously never used uh, for a time. Because they had these very long runways, uh, it was still used to train 747 pilots out of Kansas City. Uh, now we'll talk about the Capitol little, built a little, uh, building a little bit, and of course we've got Matt here uh, to answer questions uh, that you have that I can't answer. By 1907, the second Capitol building uh, had settled between six and eight inches over primarily in what we call the northeast corner of the building. Uh, when it was discovered, uh, it, people began to think that the building was collapsing, uh, thinking back to the first Capitol building, Lincoln, which literally did collapse and literally uh, dissolve. Uh, the stone proved to be such poor quality. So people kind of thought, I think, in general, that the building was failing. Uh, what they didn't realize was that, in fact, the building was pretty sturdy uh, and probably would 
still be in use today because that's uh, roughly the time period of capital in uh, Colorado and Denver. Uh, and our building was in pretty good shape other than the fact that it, it fell six to eight inches in the corner. And when a masonry building sinks six to eight inches, lots of interesting things happen. Um, the plaster cracks off the walls, even the glass in the windows break. And they were afraid that, of course, steel beams could do this, six and eight inches, quite a bit. Uh, so they began to looking at uh, what to do about that. Uh, 1917, a plan was floated to build a new Capitol building at 27th and O, uh, what we sometimes call Rogers Tract. Uh, that didn't fly. Uh, they then, at, at that same time, built a steam plant on the south lawn of the building. Uh, 1919, uh, the Capitol Commission was appointed. Um, Thomas Kimball of Omaha will enter the fray and will come up with a plan to have a contest to design a new building for the state of Nebraska. Um, ultimately, the good hue design will be picked. And here are, these are some of the other designs. First of all, it was a contest which strictly had Nebraska uh, architects involved in it. I think there were three that were chosen on that. Then it was opened up to the United States. And we ultimately ended up down to 10. Uh, these are the nine runners up, and the one that you can see right in the middle at the top was Ellery Davis is from Lincoln, and probably the only other one that we would say really had a tower concept with it. The others I call kind of a federal concept, the same uh, sort of design that Capitol buildings were being built all over. Uh, the Goodhue design was uh, ultimately chosen. And one of the concepts which was floated, but not by Goodhue, I don't believe, was that the possibility of putting 15th Street under the Capitol building as a tunnel uh, and a traffic circle around it. Well, nothing came of this at all. It was certainly fanciful and, a, and a, an interesting thing, only as far as I know exists in this sort of a sketch which was made by somebody. Test excavations for the building were then begun in 1921. Uh, for a building which was to cost five million dollars. Governor, instead of turning over a spade of uh, dirt, Sam McKelvey has two oxen pull a plow which turns over a furrow uh, to build the building. 1922, the H Street, or H-A-I-T-C-H, sometimes spelled the H Street Railway, uh, was built to connect the Capitol building with the railroad depot, begin to dig out around the building. Ossenmacher Construction Company gets primary bid. Uh, the ground was broken on April the 15th of 1922, and on hand for that was Field Marshal Joffrey. Here we can see the excavation begin beginning, and we're going to dig around the existing building. This is the laying of the cornerstone. Uh, an interesting event because we lay the cornerstone directly adjacent to previous cornerstone, so we have the building has two cornerstones extant. What corner is that on, Matt? Uh, northeast. North north, yeah, far northeast. North east. Okay. Northeast corner. And this is the railway being laid up to the Capitol building. This is one of the ways that uh, Goodhue and others saw saving money. Uh, leaving the old Capitol building there and building around it, of course, was a great money-saving device. Uh, they, they saved tens of thousands of dollars simply by building this railway, which was, and I think probably still remains, the only state-owned railway in the United States, and it connected the Burlington Railroad Yards with the Capitol building so that we could move materials directly from the railroad clear to the property rather than unloading them on trucks then re-unloading them again on site. So a money-saving device. And by building the quadrangle around the tower, uh, we uh, did away with the necessity of moving all of the state offices buildings to outside locations and then into the new building. Instead, we're able to build around the extant building. And when the quadrangle is built and completed, we can move the offices then out into them, tear that down, and build a tower. Uh, again, saving a whole lot of money. Uh, and by this time, the estimate is now not $5 million, but $9 million. Uh, this shows, looking towards the northeast, we can see on the south lawn that power plant which has been constructed there, we mentioned earlier, and, that, and the tracks going around it. 
And of course, some of them are ultimately the train cars will come into the basement of the Capitol building so they can be unloaded literally on site. And the building begins to go up. We've got lots and lots of pictures. Uh, the ones that I have here are from the, one of the stonemasons whose name is lost in, in forever as far as I know. But if you look down into the courtyard there, you can see the tremendous amount of stonework that is there waiting to be put into place. Sort of like a huge jigsaw puzzle. Anyway, I won't belabor you with hundreds of pictures because there are that many. This is an interesting one in that it shows over on the left-hand side the old Capitol building and its dome still inside the building. Uh, and we've left a sort of a gap, if you will, on the west elevation so that we can take apart the old building and move it out through that area. And that's would be roughly where the Abraham Lincoln statue is today. Here we see the quadrangle taking shape and still the second Capitol building is popping up out of the middle of it. In fact, there is the Lincoln statue in that picture. They then sold the uh, old building uh, to be dismantled and sold for salvage. So the guy that took it down uh, was able to sell it, which saved them some money as well. Still, Abraham Lincoln is still standing there. And here the tower starts going up. Uh, the old building was removed in 1925 uh, at a cost of $34,700. And the reason it was so cheap was the fact that the guy who got the contract to remove the building was actually able to salvage the stuff and sell part of it. Uh, Goodhue himself unfortunately died at age 55 in 1924, uh, well before the building is completed. Um, and his wife said that this was, she felt partly because he was getting a lot of static uh, from a couple of people, primarily on the Capitol Commission. One gentleman who seemed to fight everything Goodhue wanted to do, and this gentleman wanted to find a cheaper alternative. He would have had concrete blocks replace stone. He would have had steel windows replace, what are they, brass? The windows? Bronze. Uh, and he had a lot of ideas that were cost cutting, uh, which he got none of them through. Fortunately, we ended up with the building as Goodhue designed it. But uh, he hounded Goodhue, uh, Mrs. Goodhue said, literally hounded him to death. Uh, so here we see the uh, tower starting up. We're looking towards the southeast in this picture. A little bit further up. Tower will be completed, 400 feet tall, 1929. And here comes the sower. Uh, the sower, of course, uh, is an interesting figure himself. Cast in New York, three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, and on his way up to the Capitol building, uh, he was on flat cars, and someone in chalk wrote on his uh, chest, you can see it there uh, in black, it says Bozo's Pal. Uh, we think we even know who it was that did it. Uh, and one of the reasons then that they felt that he should be put in a safe place before they can put him on top was because they were afraid of people writing and inscribing on him. And on the other hand, they didn't seem to be the least bit concerned about the fact that people were climbing all over him uh, and there was no attempt as far as I can see to keep people off so you have people getting up there with the kids standing on him getting their pictures taken uh, and dozens and dozens of uh, pictures showing this. There we are again and this gives you a little bit of an idea of how big the uh, sower is. Finally, we're going to hoist him up uh, to the top, I believe the 15th floor. He's hoisted up and he's laid horizontally in there to protect him from uh, people trotting all over him. We're looking towards the northwest in this picture. We can see a couple of things. We can see uh, that gap that's left in the quadrangle to the left a little bit here. Uh, and we can see downtown Lincoln off to the northwest. I believe it took eight minutes to get him from the ground up. Uh, there is a film of this, and I don't know whether you can, whether it's someplace where you can visibly see it, but um, he just simply took him up, laid him sideways, and stuck him on the 15th floor, and coated him with beeswax. Um, 
ostensibly to protect him from the elements. Hmm. <laughs> Sideways slide should have shown him standing on top of the uh, pedestal, which is a sheaf of wheat. And it, when I first went through on a tour that I remember when Laura was a little kid, the tour guide at that time said that the people in the Capitol building lived in dread and fear that someday the sower would be hit by lightning. Well, he's hit numerous times <laughs> every year. And in fact, he is, uh, in effect, a lightning rod and is said to protect, protect the building and the surrounding area under it for about a half an hour or a half a mile radius all the way around it. Uh, and we're going to see lots of little scalp singes that he gets from being hit by lightning. Uh, the unicameral, uh, this is the uh, ceremony swearing in the unicameral. Many of the 13 colonies actually had unicamerals. Uh, or one house legislatures. However, after state became states and the country, only Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania, and Vermont toyed with the idea or experimented with it briefly. 1910, there's an attempt in Nebraska or at least a consideration to make a unicameral. Uh, then in 1913, a committee reported to the unicameral in favor of a, uh, or excuse me, the bicameral in favor of a unicameral, but it failed. Uh, and at that point in time, U.S. Senator uh, Norris, George Norris, came on and became one of the primary uh, forces behind the unicameral. 1919, uh, it was again submitted to the legislature. It failed. Um, they decided that at that point in time that it should be a vote of the people as to whether we go to a unicameral from, from a bicameral. An initiative petition was circulated. It failed. Uh, the vote failed again in 1925. Failed again in 1933, but one of the things that had happened in the interim was the Great Depression. And one of the things that Norris pointed out was that a unicameral was much more efficient and would be a cost saving. And during the, uh, during the uh, Great Depression, this was greatly on everybody's mind. Uh, 1936, uh, great push uh, for the unicameral. Uh, Nebraska at that had 2,029 precincts. And of those 2,029, only 73 now voted against it. Uh, interestingly, only two daily newspapers in Nebraska came out in favor of the unicameral, uh, the Hastings Tribune and the Lincoln Star. Uh, so a lot of press against it. But uh, July the 5th of 1937, uh, the unicameral came into being. Uh, 20 states have since then considered it. Uh, the last one that I know considered it at all was uh, Minnesota under Jesse Ventura. Uh, who sent people down to look at it, but maybe the fact that it was Jesse Ventura uh, might have been one of the reasons it did not uh, pass there or really get too much consideration. Nebraska, the only one with a unicameral. Uh, some interesting things about the building. And this is uh, going from the top of the building. Oh. One of the questions which people often have to me is what happened with the existing senators or legislators the two of the two houses? Uh, in 1937, they redistrict Nebraska. And the legislation specified that there would be 30 to 50 members in the new unicameral. 285 people have <laughs> filed for that election, 122 of which had been members of one of the uh, houses before that. Uh, and then I mentioned on July 5th, 1937, uh, they were finally sworn in. When you look at Goodhue's design, he has lots of little things which the public never sees. But if you go to the top, 14th floor, where the, uh, we have that room which has, it's kind of a memorial room, if you will, black onyx as I remember it. And around on all four sides are vertical windows. Uh, and Goodhue knew that you needed to get from that floor up above it to two things. One was the, at that point, a tank floor, which had a huge steel tank which held water to provide water pressure to the upper floors of the building. And secondly, there used to be an upper observation tower. So to get from this 14th floor, which is an open room, 
to get to the top, you have to have a staircase go around, uh, a spiral staircase, if you will, around the chamber, the 14th floor, but within the sides of the masonry part of the building. So when you look at the vertical windows on the 14th floor, you aren't looking directly outside. Between that window, there is a passageway about 36 inches wide, roughly, I'm guessing. Then you have on the left-hand side, vertical windows which you are visible, which you see from the outside. So two sets of windows, and in between you have this passageway which goes around in a spiral fashion up. Now if you stop to think about it, where those floors, and it's flat for a distance, then there'll be several steps up, which you can see in the corner, and then it'll be flat, and it's flat across when there are inside and outside vertical windows. But good you realize that if you had these horizontal passages, you would cast a shadow inside the memorial room. And every time there was a flat spot, you would have a line which would be visible. And his idea was this, we'll make those floors, while they are flat, of glass so that the light will come through. We see a lot of glass floors at that point in time, clear into the 50s. Libraries are built uh, in their stack area with glass floors uh, to let light filter up and down. So it was not an unheard uh, thing at all, but glass has a couple of interesting properties. Uh, one thing is that glass in the form which we see it at, let's say, room temperature is a liquid, but it is not a liquid you see pouring, but if you would take a piece of glass, anchor it on one end, over time it would flow, if you will. Well, that wasn't a problem because it's awfully, awfully slow. But the other thing is glass tends to become opaque, and it, as it becomes opaque, of course, the shadow will reoccur. Uh, the other thing that they were afraid of is as people walked on the gl uh, glass, it would get scuffed and add to the opacity and also increase the amount of uh, light not coming through. So we see these, but we can't get to them. Uh, they are a way that you could get to the upper outside observation tower. This is looking across one of those what was glass. Now it appears to be simply be opaque, milky, sort of in color. And this is the upper observation area, which was open to the public for a while, uh, but long since has been closed off. Uh, several reasons. One is the you'd have to have somebody at these doors to let people into this area which goes up. Uh, secondarily, there are no guardrails, no, so people could fall over accidentally. Uh, all kinds of security problems, so they closed that for many reasons. Uh, we talked about the sower, let's see, he's 19 feet tall, weighs nine tons. I didn't mention that before. Uh, and he signifies that governments are founded by men to sow the seeds of better uh, and more noble lives. This is the dome. And the dome is primarily the work of a man by the name of Guastavino, and if I don't pronounce his name right, Matt will <laughs> kick me in the shins. Uh, Raphael Guastavino. Uh, in 1881, uh, Guastavino and his son, uh, Raphael Jr., came to the United States. And primarily they had developed an arch or vault system of hanging tiles. Uh, terracotta, for the most part, set in cement. In 1907, they opened a factory in the United States. 1908, senior passed away, junior took over. Uh, and then in 1920, uh, Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue specified that Guastavino tiles would be used uh, in the Capitol building. This is another thing that uh, our, our detractor friend did not like. He said that one of the things he didn't like was that Guastavino tiles were never put up for bid. Well, you can't put it up for bid if there's only one person manufacturing them, uh, which this gentleman never did quite, quite understand, but at any rate, most of them are polychrome, in other words, highly fired uh, polychrome multicolored tiles. Hildreth Meyer, Mirier? Mier. Mier, I didn't even come close, did I? Uh, was the one who designed these mosaics, mostly are burned clay, for the most part, four by eight inches. Uh, therefore, about half of, or a 
folded in half sheet of typing paper. Four by eight, roughly an inch thick, and 14 colors of polychrome. Um, the firm itself faltered after World War II and in 1961 closed, and their archives all went to Columbia University. Uh, the Capitol in Nebraska, the Nebraska State Capitol, is considered to be at the high point of the Guastavino production and design. Um, several of their works still exist and are touted heavily uh, in architectural uh, circles. The Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station uh, is probably the most thought of, but if you ever get to Boston, the Boston Public Library uses a great deal of them. Uh, the main hall on Ellis Island and Grant's Tomb all used Guastavina tiles. This is the governor's reception room. And good, you said he designed the reception room uh, in the Capitol building to be the most beautiful office and appurtenance, the governor's office and the reception hall as to be the most beautiful office rooms in the United States. Well, uh, I think he probably did a pretty good job. Uh, lots of artwork and lots of paneling. Um, George Johnson, who was formerly the state engineer, uh, was one of the people who was opposed to Goodhue, many of his, uh, many of his ideas. Uh, one of the things that he pointed out was that they used inferior stone in the interior of the building. And if you go uh, on the ground level, for example, you will see stone uh, walls all the way around, and they are what are called book-ended stone. Uh, is that quite the right term? Uh, when you take a piece of stone and you cut it into slabs, you open it like this, so that the pieces bookend and read as a book, if you will, not bookended, bo booked. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Johnson claimed was that some of these tiles were defective or panels, and he insisted they be taken out and replaced, but that destroyed the book booking. Um, and the reason they were put up in the first place was that Goodhue had noticed in buildings that as workmen stand in the, in the buildings, they stand like this with their feet on the walls. So he reasoned that if he put up the stone, it would do away with that. That's one of the reasons. So one quarry block could be cut into, what are they, a quarter, three quarters an inch, inch thick, maybe something like that, uh, with dry seams. And uh, Mr. Johnson didn't like the fact that they were dry seams, but good, he pointed out that that was very normal. Um, so we have some places in the building, and I don't know, you can probably point out to them if you take a tour where are those uh, gaps. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Johnson said that uh, the different colors of marble were not structurally sound. Well, very little of the marble pillars, if any, are actually structurally supporting. They're just merely decorative. Uh, so Goodhue, he said, had uh, specified poor quality marble. Well, so what? <laughs> um, they did overcome a great many problems in building the building. This is the Dolan painting, which is above the entrance to the State Library. And uh, Elizabeth Dolan also did all of the artwork for the original Morrill Hall uh, dioramas. Uh, she has, I think, uh, maybe 10 or 12 in the Masonic Temple downtown. And scattered around Lincoln are quite a few of her works. Uh, it was said that when it was all said and done, they saved about two and a half million dollars just in not having to move the offices out of the Capitol building to build the building, in other words, by moving into the quadrangle around it. Um, transportation vertically. Well, the building was, is sometimes considered one of the first true skyscapers. Uh, and one of the problems they had was how to transform, or how to transport people vertically. So when you go to the Capitol building, one of the things you notice when you go to the 14th floor is uh, the elevators, four elevators right now, uh, but we usually use only pr principally one to get to the 14th floor, don't we? Two of them. Uh, those elevators are tiny. You probably noticed that. And so they were experimenting with how to move people vertically. Uh, but also, I think Goodhue did not see offices in all of those tower uh, rooms. He saw a lot of that as archives, which would not have required a great deal of people going up and down. So it was an experiment. Uh, the H Street Railway alone probably saved $100,000 in and of itself. 
10,567 carloads of stone and materials that came on it. Um, the railroad existed about 10 years, and it ran down H Street, hence the name H Street. Um, there were a lot of things which were problematic. One of them was the surface of the uh, roof, if you will, of the area around the tower. Um, there were hot asphalt sheets, 12-inch uh, squares. Uh, expansion joints were a problem, water running through it, lots of problems there. Uh, and they finally got all of them solved, as far as I know, although we once in a while don't have that promenade open so that people can walk on it. Is it pretty much open now? Except, okay. Except in the okay. And also, is there, they've done away with the problem. Uh, uh, the question was, uh, what, when, when is it not open? And Matt points out that in the winter time, with ice, they close those promenades. Uh, but the, the expansion and contraction is pretty well taken care of. And so the story goes, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but uh, one of the things they noticed, people walking downtown Lincoln in the heat of the summer, that women's high heels and stuff would leave indentations in the asphalt, so they just suddenly got, came up the right idea to use some asphalt in, in between as expansion joints. Uh, some of the honors which the building got. 1929, the Palos Verdes Art Jury uh, voted it number one in the top ten examples of American architecture of that year. In 1932, it was considered to be the third most beautiful building in the United States. Uh, only two buildings came in above it, the Empire State Building and the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, the Capitol building has been pointed out was the only United States Capitol building in the United States to be paid for on completion. In 1948, 500 architects were polled uh, world around and they came up with it as the fourth in their list of top buildings and called it at that time the architectural wonder of the world and it beat the Parthenon uh, that year. Uh, 1948, engineers voted on the top 25 best built buildings in the world, and it came within that top 25 list. Uh, in 1954, it was pointed out that the cost per cubic foot of the Capitol building was less than any other state and less than any other building that had been built by a state since the days of the Republic. So lots of things about the building that were uh, unique and cost savings. We could do an entire program on the exterior uh, designs and maybe Bob has got a program and I think maybe one of you do. Uh, the carvings, uh, the law and so forth. And the Guastavino tiles are not all polychrome. I think there are Guastavino tiles on the lower level, uh, for example, in the hallway which leads uh, on the ground floor from the north end where the governor's pictures are. Those are Guastavino tiles as well, but they are not polychrome and not as interesting. And of course, the Centennial Mall is now gone, so we won't talk about that. Uh, during World War II, when very few people in the city of Lincoln had air conditioning, this is one of the pictures that appeared in the Lincoln Journal, and people ask about this all the time, uh, the city and the state allowed people to camp out overnight on the Capitol grounds. Uh, in the heat of the summer, uh, and they had several foot patrolmen's, patrolmen walking around policing uh, the building. Probably couldn't get away with that today. Another excavation was made, which uh, kind of gets forgotten, but that is in the northwest corner of the building. They dug another tunnel, which leads from the building across the street to the uh, west to the printing office, which uh, is under the ground, and that red brick building, which we see directly across the street. So another piercing of that was made uh, in one of the, uh, that would be the basement, not the sub-basement, I think. And we got opportunities to take lots of neat pictures. Uh, when they did the uh, restoration of repointing the stone and rehanging some of the stone, so great pictures of the sower and the business to have been in for a short time would have been renting scaffolding, I think. They must have had every piece of scaffolding in every state that touched Nebraska and Nebraska literally covering the building. Uh, and I thought, I, had, I talked to Bob Ripley early on and I said, you know, I would like to go up. Uh, and, but at that time, Bob said, no, you know, there's, 
there's all sorts of liability problems and it just isn't going to happen. And then suddenly I realized that something had changed and I think a lot of state senators and other people got, got up there. So by the time I got around to asking Bob again, he said, oh yeah, we did, but now it's gone again. So I never did get up to the top. How I would have done, I don't know. And is that uh, Mike, yeah, up there. And one of the things he's pointing out, not in this particular picture, is but this, the, dome, uh, the dome of the uh, sower, or his pate, if I will, uh, is covered with starbursts. Uh, some as small as a nickel or a dime, and some of them maybe the size of a silver dollar, where he's been hit by lightning. So probably hundreds, maybe thousands of times he's hit by lightning. And one of the things they did too was they cleaned him up then at that point in time. And as we looked across at him from a distance, he was dark, darkly patinated. And, and that's what I kind of thought he was supposed to look like. But they cleaned him up spruced him up, gave him a bath, and coated him with something. I don't know, but he almost looked white, Jim. What was it? It wasn't plaster of Paris, but... <laughs> it was just a patina. Uh, they just stabilized the patina, and now it's weatherproof. OK. Color Matt points out that they stabilized the patina and made it weatherproof. But he still gets hit all the time. Um, Chuck Edhelm took this picture for us. We used it on a cover of a book, Nebraska Centennial First Lady's Cookbook. But we, we decided to cut off the sower in this picture. OK, leaving the Capitol building. As I said, uh, the Capitol building could easily have a couple of entirely our programs just on the exterior of the building or the interior of the building, which we won't cover. We talk about things like the Supreme Court. Uh, room, which the Lincoln Journal pointed out one time. They were talking about people going into the cement block room, uh, which it is not. It is also a stone, but uh, lots of things to talk about. Well, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on and hopefully um, have programs just on the Capitol building by itself. Palisades Apartments uh, at uh, 1035 South 17th Street uh, were owned by a man by the name of Henry Goldenstein who designed and built the building with lots of terracotta. Uh, so we call it a terracotta-faced building, 1928 at a cost of $90,000. Uh, for reasons unclear to me, actually his wife Helen is listed as the owner of the building, probably tax purposes, I don't know. We can also see a web running through the street here from the electric trolleys which were running at that point in time. October of 28, uh, they built a three-story parking garage on the northwest corner of the property. 1937, they converted the first floor of that building to apartments. Then in 1953, they converted the entire parking garage into apartments. So if you look at the building closely, uh, that building which is standing next to it is actually not apartments. It would be built as a, a parking garage. Uh, the third building, which was completed, cost $50,000. Uh, and this is the building as is ostensibly completed then. Herpelsheimers. Henry Herpelsheimer was born in Prussia in 1844. Uh, he immigrated to the United States, worked in dry goods stores all over the United States, and came to the city of Lincoln in 1880. Uh, he port partnered with a man by the name of Otto Morenstretcher, whose name is really tough to say and worse to spell. They had a store at 1109 O Street, uh, which would put it on the uh, south side of O Street between 11th and 12th. Uh, they really were very successful and increased their inventory on hand from $20,000 to $109,000 just in their second year of operation. So very successful. Then in 1890 they built this new building on the southwest corner of 12th and N Streets and if you look to the left hand side above it you can see the dome of uh, what was originally uh, First Methodist Church then in 1888 roughly became uh, St. Paul Methodist Church. That locates it for you so you know where we're sitting. Uh, three floors tall, 63,000 square feet of retail space. Uh, they had their own electrical light generating plant in the basement uh, which served two purposes. One, to light the building, but also an important part of it was to run freight elevators, which are run on direct current. They called it the daylight store because of the extreme number of windows and, and lighting, also called the glass block. 
the interior, all of the fixtures were made of oak and anodized silver, oxidized silver, excuse me. They had 150 clerks and a 34 cash railway system. And some of you will remember a cash railway system in Miller and Payne's, which was pneumatic, uh, and apparently this one was too, uh, where all of the departments where you would go and pay for your purchase did not have a cash register. Uh, they had a spot where they would have a cylinder about so long and so big around. Uh, they would put the sales ticket and your money into that, put it into the tube and whoosh it up to the office. Uh, Miller and Payne's up on the fifth floor of the office. Their change would be made, a receipt was issued, and it put it back in the tube, back down to the correct cash register. Uh, we're still using those in Brandeis when we had their store in Omaha at Crossroads. They still used that system for a while. Uh, quickly did away with that part of it, though, because uh, it becomes very cumbersome and time-consuming. And if you have a line of people at the cash register or the cash point, as they called it, uh, very time-consuming. The idea was if you had 150 employees, you might have 15 or 20 potential cash registers around the building, which all had to have a float of money in them, which is a considerable amount of money, which would, uh, at that time, the interest loan on that was a considerable amount of money. And that's the reason Brandeis fought it tooth and nail to the very end. The other place which used it in Lincoln was Wells and Frost's original store, uh, which was on O Street. Uh, and they had what they called a flyer system. And there, their office was in the front of the store on the second floor and scattered around on the floor were these flyers where you would have a cash point. And here you would have a wire basket and wires strung on the ceiling. Um, the cashier again would take your money, put it into the wire basket, and he would release that basket which would fly on a spring up to the office. Then when it came back down, uh, gravity would bring it back down and it would spring itself again. So up and down it went. Well, uh, an interesting system. Uh, in 1903, they built a separate store directly to the west, which became their furniture store. Uh, 1923, uh, they had over 200 employees, and at that point in time were Lincoln's oldest department store. 1931, with the Depression, the store closed. A freebie in there. <laughs> Uh, this shows the store in its closing out days. Uh, everything is on sale, and you'll notice too that in this picture later on, St. Paul has lost its dome uh, and is now flat as it is today. Uh, the store to the west was purchased by George Meckling, who put a farm store in there. Uh, this building will be torn down and become the Firestone store. But with the Firestone store there, a couple of things remained. The entire basement stayed, and the Firestone store, uh, owned by D. Aichi at that time, used it as a parking garage. Um, so the entire basement became a parking garage. Uh, some of the exterior walls remained. This is the alley wall or the west elevation of the building, and we can see to the right uh, the south elevation of the building. Uh, with entrance doors which no longer went any place but they left the walls there nonetheless. Then finally in 1998 they tore it all down, cleaned it out. Uh, this is looking across the hole, the clean hole they're building towards the east. We can see uh, the savings and loan building over there and here you can still see the basement walls before they've been removed. And of course they're going to fill it all in and build the current Firestone store uh, with no basement. This is looking towards the northeast. Again, you can see the uh, basement walls of the building still. No, we're looking towards the northwest, I'm sorry, because that's Gold's down there in the back. October of 1940, a film was made in Lincoln, and not certainly the first one, but certainly the first major film. It was called Cheers for Miss Bishop. Uh, written by Best Streeter Aldridge uh, in uh, Elmwood, and it was filmed primarily on the University of Nebraska campus. Uh, here we can see that they hired 600 students as extras to make it. Uh, it had its grand opening in two theaters, the Stewart and the Nebraska Theater. Uh, the young lady on the right is Barbara Scott. Her father was chief of staff at the Veterans Hospital in Lincoln.
This is an examination group uh, which formed before the Air Force Base was built. And these guys were sort of a group of uh, local businessmen, entrepreneurs, and engineers and everything who met uh, more or less quietly uh, to determine whether the Lincoln Municipal Airport might be converted to an air base. Uh, the construction started in 1942 and through the years they trained 25,000 aviation mechanics and 40,000 other support people for World War II here. Um, activated, reactivated, deactivated through the years, reactivated again in 1952, uh, spent another $29 million uh, on redoing the, the project. Lincoln Air Force Base, uh, it supported 6,500 men and their dependents at that point in time. Lots of pictures of Lincoln Air Force Base and various facilities closed finally in 1966. Uh, 640 acres of land owned by the federal government at that time, uh, 1,600 acres of uh, city-owned land and everything there reverted to the city of Lincoln. Uh, if it's true, and I, I don't know whether it is or not, but the story, it's a great story, so we'll tell it anyway. And that is when the federal government returned the Lincoln Air Force Base property to the city of Lincoln, the city of Lincoln said, no, no. You have to remove all of the buildings. It, the contract we had with you says that you have to return it as it was, remove the buildings that you built in the last part. Well, that would have cost the federal government a fortune, so they figured out a deal with the city of Lincoln. The city of Lincoln agreed to take the property with all of the buildings, and it proved to be a great boon because that enabled the Lincoln Municipal Airport Authority, which is a taxing authority, to never issue a tax. They've leased out some of the buildings. Uh, some of the buildings are used even in the hangars. Goodyear had two of them for a long time. So they had income from this property uh, through the years, making it a taxable authority that never issued a tax. That may come to a halt at some point, I don't know. This is probably a good place to stop. Next time we will pick up Huskerville, which is a little bit longer story, and see if there are questions or corrections. Wayne. The question was, are there any pictures of Mari Sandoz watching the Capitol building being built? And I know you have an, a purpose in asking that question. I know of none. Uh, obviously, if there are any, I would check first with the State Historical Society, who has a pretty good uh, index of their properties. But I know of no pictures of Mari Sandoz watching the Capitol building. She, she but did. She it seems like, it, yeah, it seems like it's a no-brainer. Uh, but whether anybody took a picture. One of the pictures that I've always thought should exist and doesn't apparently is the second Capitol building. The, the current building is the third Capitol building, but the second Capitol building was built in the same fashion as our present one in that they built one wing and another wing leaving that little old building in the middle. And wouldn't that have made a great picture? Uh, and there must have been somebody must have taken a picture. Wayne, look through your pictures. Uh, uh, of the two of the two buildings standing, book ended around that little old building. But as far as I know, they don't exist. So there's a picture of Mary Sandoz out there someplace, uh, but I don't know where it is. Another question? Yeah, I think. Oh yeah, the cash yeah. systems. Yeah. Well, uh, the question was how long did those cash systems last? As far as I know, Herpelsheimers used it until they closed the store in the Depression because Wells and Frost was using that system until they moved uh, from their old store. Uh, it, it was used clear into the, I would say, the 70s, 1970s. Uh, there was a bookstore in Omaha, Matthew's bookstore, that was using it close to the time it was torn down. Uh, Ed, when, when did Matthew's close? you remember probably 1980s maybe? 
so they were, of course, Matthews had a very small store, uh, and they didn't have but maybe two cash points. And it was probably much more efficient than it would have been in a store the size of Miller and Payne's. Uh, Miller and Payne's was also on the cutting edge of things like the wand that reads barcodes. And when we first took over the book department there, we had these pens. They were about this long. Uh, and you would read the barcode. It would work occasionally. Uh, and you would read it and read it and read it, and it would break down. But IBM was experimenting at the same time. So Miller and Payne was on the very cutting edge of those barcode readers, which now everybody uses, and they work instantly with a bing, they go. You don't have to run your pen over it anymore. So, but the cash points, to your point, uh, there may still be some used. Uh, no reason why they couldn't be. I don't know of any. Yes, uh, Jeff. Capitals built of Indiana limestone. Do we know what the first two capitals were built of? Well, the first one we had it. Uh, the question was, we know that the present Capitol building is Indiana limestone for the most part. Uh, and, and Jeff's question is, do we know what the first two capitals were built of? Yeah, we do. Uh, and the first Capitol building, that's a long story. It's built of uh, what they thought was blue magnesia limestone, quarried at various places, mostly from Holmesville, which is near Blue Springs, Wyoming, or Blue Springs, uh, uh, and uh, Blue Springs in the corner of Nebraska down in the county there. Uh, Holmesville is where, did I just say that? I think I'm being redundant. Uh, that stone was of very poor quality. Some of it was probably quarried at Saltillo, which is even worse quality. And that's the reason that building didn't stand very long. They used a great deal of stone and all, there was no brick at all used in the first building. They substituted stone because there was, a, when the building was built, there was literally no, no brickyards. Uh, so it was a very poor quality stone. And where was the stone from the second building? Was that Bedford? Is, the second uh, building came from uh, South Bend, Nebraska. Um, and there was another quarry even up uh, where the uh, post office building was built at the Guire Brothers Quarry. That was near Plattsmouth. Much better stone. Uh, other question? And if, if not, we can answer that question in more detail. The South, the South Bend, Nebraska stone was actually pretty and the South Bend stone, Matt points out, was actually pretty decent. It stood pretty well, and we know there are pieces of it still around that are in excellent condition uh, where we, we find them. Uh, and it, would that be the same stone as the Guire Brothers Quarry that built the old Capitol? Okay, or the old post office, federal courthouse, Eileen. Um, the question is that stone, which is along the O Street front in the own city hall, Ed, do we know exactly where they're coming? It is a similar stone, if not the same stone, and it weathers terribly or extremely uh, weathers. It. it is Dakota sandstone, which is even, even worse than all those others. Okay, Ed points out Dakota sandstone, which proves to be even worse. I'm hoping that we figure out a way to stabilize it so that we can preserve it where it is, but I don't know whether anybody effort has been made to do that. I don't know, but at any rate, it is an example of how stone can weather, Wayne. Uh, the airfield that you mentioned first, Page Field, I, uh, I thought that was owned by a private person, maybe Mr. Page, rather than the city of Lincoln, but do, do you know? Well, his question is, who owned the original? Are you talking the one that ran on 19th Street between Van Dorn and Calvert? Uh, as far as I know, that field was owned by the Woods Brothers. Anybody correct that? Of course, the Woods will own it later on as they develop uh, Woodshire. Uh, but whether the Pages owned that or not, I am not sure. But we can easily find out the answer to that question uh, because Del Lineman's son would have that answer, I'm sure. Okay. But I think airfield is on lease land. I think we may, I think we'll find it's the underlying farm owner. Okay. Ed's point is that there was probably the underlying farm owner owned it, and of course the Woods Brothers bought it to develop it as Woodshire, right? I think it might be Xtel. Might be the name we'll find. Okay. The the name of the owner may have been a farmer by the name of Xtel. That is our time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>